thank you for that introduction. Um, <clears throat> so, oh. <clears throat> so our research has as its backdrop a classic social psychological phenomena. <laughs> <clears throat> and that is the phenomenon, phenomenon of belief perseverance. People resist information that contradicts long-held beliefs and attitudes. Phil Tetlock, in his recent book on so-called political experts, finds that even so-called political experts are not immune to this phenomenon. Uh, that they, when unambiguously confronted with evidence that their political forecasts were wrong, believe that they were right or wrong for the right reasons. Uh, so this sort of bias is pervasive and plays out in a number of different contexts. And in the research that I wanted to <coughs> discuss today, uh, we examine how people's pre-existing beliefs, identities, and ideologies impede their openness both to new information and new opportunities and their empathy to members of, uh, of outgroups. I'll touch on work in three different paradigms that examine this general topic. Uh, I'm just going to call up one or two studies from, from each line of research, really just taking the blush off the rose. Uh, but in one paradigm, we look at the role of ideologies about race and punitive reactions to minority victims. In another paradigm, we examine the role of identity and resistance to persuasion and intergroup conflict. And in a final, paradigm, we examine the role of, as mentioned in the introduction, uh, constructive criteria of merit in allowing people to simultaneously discriminate while maintaining an illusion of personal meritocracy. In all our research, we do something that I think is somewhat uncommon. We try to isolate social psychological processes in order to test theory-driven intervention strategies. So the notion in a lot of this work is that by understanding how things work, we should be able, if our theory is good, be able to intervene and stop the biases from happening. OK, first paradigm, role of ideologies about race and punitive reactions to minority victims. Gustav Ickheiser once wrote that the prejudice are not those who insist that people are different, but those who deny it. Since we start with the false assumption that people are essentially alike, and then find by experience that they are unlike we denounce as well as persecute each other because we are different. So there's a sort of intriguing notion that the assumption of similarity and the denial of difference is at the root of prejudice. Uh, we examined this as an ideological question in which we measured people's tendency to deny difference, what many people call a colorblind ideology, the belief that different ethnic groups are fundamentally the same in their experiences and problems and opportunities. And we explore this as an individual difference variable in <clears throat> predicting uh, interracial empathy, or as this ideology is a barrier to interracial empathy. So here's what we did, simple paradigm. We measure participants' endorsement of a colorblind ideology with several different items, such as members of different racial and ethnic groups see the world similarly or fundamentally the same in terms of the societal problems that they confront, agree-disagree scales. Uh, then two to three weeks later, we bring them into the lab and we expose people to a threat to their colorblind ideology. We have them review a caseworker's report of a minority welfare applicant who's confronting a lot of problems living in poverty. And our manipulation is this, her problems, her name is Angela, uh, are explained in either individual-based terms or race-based terms. So in the individual-based conditions, uh, there is a sentence or two about how she faces stress from coping with the pressures of being a single mother in the US. In the race-based condition, there is a sentence or two about how she faces stress from coping with the problems that many black Americans have to face in the US. This is it, it's a three-page case report the manipulation is embedded in a few sentences. Her problems are identical. What varies between conditions are the attribution for the problem, whether they're based in a person's individual experience or in experiences that might be partially associated with race. Uh, this latter condition we call a colorblind threat condition because we're confronting people with a threat to this notion that members of different ethnic groups are fundamentally the same. <clears throat> Our primary DV is victim blaming of this applicant, Angela, welfare applicant. So we ask them, 
We assess how much they stereotype the applicant as lazy, lacking work ethic, how punitive they are, how much that they think that she shouldn't be given any benefits, how much they think that she should be forced into a, uh, a job training program. And what we find is that in the individual-based condition, where her problems are faced as those of an individual, uh, <clears throat> if anything, high colorblind subjects are less victim blaming. So it's a correlation, but it suggests that there might be something in this ideology that enables people to see the common humanity across racial lines uh, among those facing a problem. <clears throat> <clears throat> but in the race-based condition, this completely reverses. Uh, it's really intriguing how this manipulation, a relatively small manipulation, creates a complete crossover interaction such that when Angela's problems are framed more in terms of race, high colorblind subjects are very victim blaming. Their, their <clears throat> mean score and victim blaming goes up significantly. So people are very sensitive to whether the attribution for a problem concords or conflicts with their ideology about race. So just that responses to victims are also about ideological defense, possibly. <clears throat> So in some sense, this is consistent with a lot of previous research on bias, assimilation, belief, perseverance. What's interesting to us also is that you get these ripple effects. So people kind of go away from this encounter with a single victim to change their construal of the very social problem. Later on, in the context of a separate study, we asked subjects their attitudes on several different, uh, on several different issues, social issues. And one of those issues is, uh, assesses how much they blame the poor uh, for their, their plight. And higher numbers here just mean more victim blaming. Uh, again, in the individual-based condition, they had just read about Angela, the single welfare applicant in the individual-based condition. Again, we see high colorblind subjects more charitable in their attributions about poverty. They blame the problems of poverty more on the environment than on the deficits of poor people. But we see this stunning reversal in the race-based explanation condition, where all of a sudden, high colorblind subjects, in particular, are showing a lot of movement such that they blame the deficit to poor people more for the problem of, of poverty than social structural factors. <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> we also get the same effects for support for social programs to ameliorate poverty. Uh, what this all suggests is that responses to victims are partly driven by ideology. What's our time, actually? Is it good till quarter? quarter after? OK. Um, we look at an intervention strategy, um, and here we were thinking that, well, one of the th interesting things about ideology is that ideology kind of conflates these two things, what should be true and what is true. And it's often the case that with ideology, people go from what should be true to think what is true. We should live in a colorblind society, therefore we do live in a colorblind society. So we thought that maybe decoupling these things, honoring colorblindness as an ideal, but decoupling it from the reality might be an effective intervention strategy. So in our intervention condition, we gave subjects a persuasive message uh, that went, you know, to make a long story short, it just read, to achieve the ideal of colorblindness, we need to acknowledge the reality of race-based differences in experience. It actually took us a while to think of this, but the notion is to honor the ideal of colorblindness, but portray multiculturalism as a means to attaining that ideal. When we look at victim blaming in the race-based explanation condition, in the, in the control message condition, <clears throat> we see the same pattern of high colorblind subjects more victim blaming than low colorblind subjects. And this is wiped out in this intervention condition where we frame, where we decouple the ideal of colorblindness from the reality of colorblindness. OK, so summary, responses both to victims and to social problems are, of course, affected by ideology. As Brian mentioned, ideology is a meaning maker, a sense maker. It kind of is like a lens that we use to interpret social problems. It can be a source of empathy or a source of defensiveness.